This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at www.dashlane.com slash infographics. And never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. So far in our hacker series of shows, we've concentrated mostly on the more nefarious type of hacking, a milieu consisting of what's known as black hat hackers. These are the guys and girls that have honed their skills to get through back doors and steal information that they might sell on, hold ransom, or simply use to buy something on your credit card. They might also want to cause mayhem just because they can. Then we have the gray hats, and those guys often exploit a vulnerability in a system and then tell a company or organization that they have a problem. A Achilles heel, and you can pay them or hire them to fix it for you. But now, let's have a look at the unsung heroes of hacking, the protectors of the binary realm, the White Hats. So who are these guys, the White Hats, the ethical specialists of finding faults in systems and patching up holes? According to Technopedia, they are the experts that are hired by companies or other entities to break into systems. Here you go, do your best, an employee might tell them. They have, in some cases, been hired from the dark side, usually not the hyper-criminally dark side, and are so the perfect fit. After all, if you wanted to hire someone to ensure no one robs your bank, why not hire a bank robber? They're there to make sure the nemeses, the black hats, can't do damage. Their methods of hacking, of course, might be very similar to the black hats. They might have trained on the same training ground, but their job is to try and keep one step ahead of their foes or the company's foes. They are indispensable, and they're not just protecting company or government information, but protecting you. You have all the information online that you don't want to be seen, don't want stolen. And in part, it's thanks to these people that you can sleep at night with the assurance that the data you put online remains protected, but you could call them gatekeepers of information, except they are also highly skilled burglars, the best ones we'll talk about soon. If you've seen our other shows on hackers, you'll know that organizations are keen to hire these people, some of whom have been less ethical about hacking in the past. You might have governmental departments showing up to hacker conferences and headhunting individuals with a certain skill set. One problem there, as Rolling Stone reported, is that some of these guys might have the skills, but they're not exactly office material, and some of them have criminal records, not really good on a resume for an FBI interview. Oftentimes, organizations want to tempt the bad guys to the good side, but we could say there's a certain level of badness which might preclude that transition ever being made. Still, we're about to tell you about some former black hats that did do a fair bit of damage before they hooked up with the good guys and donned an office regulation tie. Kevin Mitnick We've talked about this man before, but we can't do a show on white hats without including someone who is often called the world's most famous hacker. Let's first say that Mitnick was imprisoned for his crimes, but he's often said his blackness was overstated, as he was made an example of. He is somewhat the poster boy of hacking, having been the inspiration for some of those hacking movies which depicted 80s kids giving the government a hard time from their bedrooms. Mitnick has said that his early hacking wasn't really techno-hacking but human exploitation, sometimes called social engineering. If you've seen the series Mr. Robot, you'll know that hackers often get information merely by deceit on the telephone. That series was partly written by people who know hacking and social engineering works. But Mitnick graduated to computers and ended up hacking companies such as Nokia and Pacific Bell. He went on the run after that, but he was eventually found and sentenced to a long jail sentence for a crime he committed. During his five years behind bars, he said he was treated badly and did quite a bit of time in solitary confinement. His real love wasn't stealing per se, but he just enjoyed testing his skills. At 16 years old, for instance, he created a program that simulated the computers at school, and so when a teacher logged in, Mitnick could get their information. I took his password, logged in, and just had a huge smile on my face that it worked," he said in an interview in 2018. But his curiosity got the better of him and his world turned darker. After prison, though, he started his own security company and concentrated his efforts on helping others to stave off black hats. In an interview, he explained this switch quite clearly. It was a vicious cycle. I got busted, I did it again. I got busted, I did it again. In a way, I still do it today, but now I just get permission from my clients and get paid. Adrian Lamo Unfortunately, this hacker is no longer with us, having passed away in 2018. He gained his notoriety for hacking the New York Times as well as tech behemoths Microsoft and Yahoo, but his world came crashing down in 2003 when he was arrested for those hacks as well as others. He took it on the chin though, saying in court, I want to answer for what I've done and do better with my life. He also later said, we all own our actions in fullness, not just the pleasant aspects of them. 
In 2009, Lama was involved in a controversial case involving U.S. whistleblower Bradley, now Chelsea Manning. The latter had confided to the wrong man, as Lama was working for law enforcement and he blew the whistle on the whistleblower. Subsequently, many people around the world criticized Lamo, and many of his detractors were in the hacking community. He had become an outcast. Lamo later explained his actions to The Guardian, saying, There were hundreds of thousands of documents, let's drop the number to 250,000 to be conservative, and doing nothing meant gambling that each and every one would do no harm if no warning was given. He later went to the light side and became a security consultant, but his life was never easy after the Manning controversy. He received death threats regularly, and he was also known to abuse substances. When he died in 2018, his autopsy was inconclusive. Here we have dark to light to the great unknown. Robert Dappen Morris A New York Times headline from 1989 reads, Cornell suspends computer student. The story tells of a 23-year-old student who had jammed a nationwide computer network. What had Morris been up to? Well, he's now known as the man that created the first worm-like virus known as the Morris Internet Worm. All over the place, computers were slowing and crashing and no one knew what was happening. This worm that Morse had created, he intended not to wreak havoc. It said that he only created it to see how far it would spread and so to be able to judge the size of the internet. Except it just kept replicating and soon he couldn't stop it. We're told that when it was done, the worm had infected 10% of the world's internet servers, which is some accomplishment. According to one of Morris's friends back then, the student knew he had made a colossal mistake. He was later arrested and charged under the then New Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, getting off lightly with just a fine of $10,000 and a few hundred hours of community service. If you did that now, you'd get yourself into way more trouble. Since breaking the internet, Morris has dedicated his time toward research, and he also co-founded the incubator company Y Combinator. He is tenure at MIT and has served as an advisor to various companies. Kevin Polson also known as Dark Dante in another life, Mr. Polson rose to notoriety after doing something we'd all likely love to do. He won himself a Porsche, but he didn't exactly play the game fairly. To ensure that he won, he hacked a radio station's phone lines. He made it so he was guaranteed to be the winner. But then he graduated from phone lines to hacking into federal systems and getting his hands on FBI wiretap information. He was eventually caught and ended up with a $56,000 fine and also a prison sentence. In an interview with Gizmodo in 2015, Polson said that he was busy consulting for a Hollywood hacker movie. He also became a journalist and at times has helped law enforcement track down darker characters that plague the internet. As for hacking, he said in an interview that it often starts with phishing. He said a hacker will often send a phishing email to a person working in a big organization, such as the NSA. The email looks legitimate because the hacker has learned what kind of email the agent might get. He also said this in another interview, this time with Vanity Fair. You certainly are seeing that these days attacking somebody's PC instead of attacking their server and logging their keystrokes and all of that. This is exactly what the hackers are doing right now. So beware, folks. Mark Abney This hacker was once a member of the hacking conglomerates Legion of Doom and Masters of Deception. He started young and became one of the world's most famous hackers after he was arrested by authorities in 1990. He was accused of various things, including crashing the network of AT&T. He was a minor when he did that, but still served a year in prison and was handed 600 hours of community service. Many thought he didn't deserve this, and yet again they said another person had been made an example of. This seems to happen often because there's nothing more for authorities to fear than someone sneaking around in their networks. Abney went on to do a lot of TV appearances and speaking about security to some of the world's leading publications. He also started his own consultancy firm, but that didn't do too well. After my own consulting firm folded after the dot-com burst in the early 2000s, I continued doing independent security consulting for a lot of large companies, Abney told CNET in an interview. A fun job I had recently was writing the encryption routines for the online streaming service for Major League Baseball. Anon and Famous the people we've talked about are all just some names you see in the media, but black hat hackers that have turned into white hat hackers are usually nameless. They're guys that have been taken out of the wild and brought into the office. We know that the FBI has employed some of these people, but reports tell us the likes of Google, Uber, and even Starbucks have been putting reformed black hats on their payroll. We might also remember that the likes of Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg and Twitter's Jack Dorsey also hacked into emails. Zuckerberg, and a network of potential employers, Dorsey, and no doubt many others have done similar things.
Hackers are a threat to everyone, not just big companies but everyday people like you and me. In fact, you might be a bigger target than a company with professional security. That's why you need Dashlane. Think of them as your own personal cyber bodyguard in a dangerous cyber world and the one and only tool you need to keep safe online. We now make sure our whole team is secured by Dashlane. With a VPN, password generator, and breach alerts to let you know when your logins suffer breaches or hacks. Dashlane actively works to protect you across all of your devices and online accounts, so you can rest easy. Head on over to dashlane.com slash infographics for a free 30-day trial, and if you use the coupon code infographics, you can get 10% off a premium subscription today. What do you think about black and white hat hackers? Let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other show, Did North Korea Really Hack Sony Pictures Because of a Movie? Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.